Hey guys, um, welcome to the book of Micah. So Micah, uh, a minor prophet with a major message and something very applicable to us today. So let's start with um, his name, which means who is like Yahweh or Jehovah, either one. So his message was addressed to Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom, though the northern kingdom is addressed in the message, um, he is really mainly speaking to the south. So first we have, as always, an introduction. Um, the first verse where he says, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, uh, the Merishethite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, right, not Israel, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So it has to do with the sins of both the north and the south kingdom. However, he's dealing with um, a direct message to the southern kingdom. So his first message is a judgment um, for both Samaria, which is the capital of the northern kingdom, and Judah, in the first two chapters. And he gives the prediction of that coming judgment at the beginning of chapter 1. And then <clears throat> he laments over it through the end of the chapter. He walks through some of the cities to talk about how they should um, not take any comfort as though they're going to be missed. But uh, the judgment's going to hit all of them so his lament is in chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 um, he has a call to these other cities to mourn and then he details the sins of judah in chapter 2 the people first of all then the false prophets and then he gives a prediction for the future regathering and remember um, all the prophets for the most part um, think Jonah would be the exception, provides some hope and um, discussion about the restoration of Israel, ultimately. But right now, um, in Micah, we see that um, interwoven through his message. He'll talk about judgment, some aspect. He'll provide some hope for the future, talk about judgment, provide the hope. So, uh, and then finally does it at the end. So in the book, so we know where he's prophesying from. Uh, there's Jerusalem, and there is where he prophesies from. That's where he's from. So he's right down in the southern kingdom, right? He's from a rural background. And then for time frame, these are the kings that he is prophesying in uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And you can see, so he, he prophesied really during just the beginning of the reign of Hezekiah. Uh, notice that both him and Isaiah are contemporaries. Isaiah had a little longer prophecy, but for the most part, they were pretty much contemporaries. Now, in order to understand the difference between both Isaiah and Micah, though they're prophesying during the same time and to the southern kingdom, um, Isaiah's prophecy revealed God's judgment with man directly with the throne of God. In other words, um, Isaiah saw the judgment to Judah coming directly from the throne of God. Um, you know, he had the vision in Isaiah 6 um, where he received his call. So, as far as Isaiah's view of what was happening, it was directly uh, from God. Now, <clears throat> though very similar, um, Micah's prophecy revealed God's judgment with the delegated authorities. So Micah focuses on the uh, princes, right? Civil leaders, priests, spiritual leaders, the prophets, the moral leaders who were to represent divine authority to the people. They had failed in that. That's why they were going to be going into judgment to Babylon. So they were corrupt. And what 
Micah does is he unmasks that corruption or that misrule so that he can proclaim the true ruler, the real king of Israel, which is God. So <clears throat> moving on, what we see as a background here is that we have um, when Ahaz, who was a wicked king, was reigning in the, in the south, the political tensions during his reign really led to the subjection to Assyria. So the Assyrians came down. Uh, they were harassing the southern kingdom. Uh, they had really had their way in the northern kingdom. And then Hezekiah came into reign. And though he was a good king, he attempts to break free from the Assyrian rule, but ultimately really cannot. Uh, they don't overtake uh, the southern kingdom, uh, but they're not able to be really free from them. Um, they certainly defeat them in the battle where um, Isaiah is involved with Hezekiah uh, during his reign. And the angel of the Lord goes out and slays 185,000 um, soldiers in one night. But if we look earlier in the prophecy of Isaiah, then we find that the Assyrians had done some damage to the southern kingdom uh, before ultimately they were out of the picture. But the people worship God as an obligation, but there was really no life-changing reality. And we see that today anyways. We see that even among Christians. There's a lot of Christians that go to church, um, a lot of people that claim to be Christians, but there's really no life-changing reality in them. And look, we're all sinners. Um, everybody is from the same cut from the same cloth in that sense but there is an opportunity for god to change our lives and we need to be not only sensitive to that but we need to be open to the work that he wants to do and then he does that cleaning up but that only happens if we actually get serious with god uh, other than that we just kind of perform a function we we learn how to be Christians, we learn how to sound like Christians, how to do the Christian thing, and then it just becomes a routine. And they didn't walk humbly with God. Isaiah, um, Mal Micah 6, 8, excuse me, is kind of the focal verse, really, of the, of the book. Um, so they didn't walk humbly with God, but they instead failed to practice judge justice and then they pursued idolatry so um, in chapter 6 verse 8 just to read it really quickly um, and we'll get to it but just to have it in the back of your mind he says he has showed thee, O man what is good and what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly to love mercy and walk humbly with thy God that's what God wanted. God wasn't looking for anything magnanimous. He, he didn't want, um, you know, supreme sacrifices or uh, anything that was beyond what he was desiring of them, really, morally and spiritually, which was to uh, be humble before him, have a genuine relationship, and then extend the same mercy and justice that he had extended to them he wanted them extending it to others and that was part of the mosaic covenant they needed to do that or they would be judged so they were not only judged for that but their idolatry too which filled in the gap when 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 god is not taking the main place and the supreme place in our life we're going to fill it with something else uh, that was like that for the jews uh, under the mosaic covenant and it's no different for Christians today. So we need to focus on um, putting God first and having that place in our life given to him. Then everything will fall in line uh, appropriately under that. Otherwise, it's all upside down. So the reasons for judgment, first of all, corrupt leaders. We see that in chapter 2. Uh, Micah expands on that for us. And the corrupt leaders resulted in oppression and injustice of the poor and the vulnerable. And that's how it always is in any nation when you have 
um, corrupt leadership, then they take advantage of that because of the authority that they have. And then they end up um, providing themselves all kinds of benefits where at the same time, um, the people that need help the most and need the most protection and security uh, get the least because people basically are selfish. And if you put people like that into leadership that are corrupt, then it's going to come out in their leadership. That's why in Proverbs it talks so much about um, righteousness as the strength of any throne. So the first example we have of this in chapter 2, the first two verses, it says those who devise sinful plans are as good as dead. Those who dream about doing evil as they lie in bed. As soon as the morning dawns, they carry out their plans because they have the power to do so. In other words, they were in those authoritative positions. They confiscate the fields they desire. In other words, the people that <clears throat> could not afford to keep them. They would put pressure on them uh, for their mortgages and everything else. And so they would find a way to basically force it from them and seize the house houses they want. So they wanted property. They found a way to get it because of their position in government. They defraud people of their homes and deprive people of the land they have inherited. Now, God wanted these families to remain with that inheritance that was given to them initially when they came into the land because that was passed on family to family. God dealt with Israel as a large family. That's why they couldn't collect interest from other people. Uh, they had to deal with people under the Mosaic Covenant um, as though they were all related, which they were um, ultimately. So, and this is a little bit of an easier translation. This is the net translation. I figured that would be easier for these couple of verses. Uh, so that's what I put up. Moving on in chapter 2, verse 8. <clears throat> It says lately, and the word means, um, in other words, to this very hour, my people have risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with the garment from those who trust you as they pass by like men returned from war. So they were basically taking advantage of people. And not only had they become an enemy of God, but they become an, an enemy of each other. And the greedy people were taken advantage because they had the power to do so. This is a continuation of what Micah explains based on verses 1 and 2. The third example in chapter 3 says, You eat the flesh of my people after you strip their skin from them and break their bones. You chop them up like flesh for the cooking pot like meat in a cauldron. Now, they weren't literally uh, committing cannibalism. The idea is metaphorically, like he says, you chop them up like flesh for the cooking pot. They weren't actually cooking them. But basically, the people were there. Uh, you know, there's an old saying that, you know, they see people as dollar signs. In other words, they're just there for financial advantage for people. Well, uh, sometimes political leaders, um, in this case in Israel, the civil and the spiritual leaders, because they were corrupt, um, they looked at the people as nothing more than a way for them to enrich themselves. And where it talks about um, meals, which is a, a mainstay really of their economy, you know, food in an agrarian society, they saw the people as just really a way to um, some somebody that they could extract an advantage of and then make themselves wealthy and essentially live the luxurious life. So um, this is what God was judging them for, and this is what he was angry at. So <clears throat> the fourth example um, in chapter 3, verse 9, the beginning of verse 10, he says, now hear this, you heads of Jacob, right, and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all equity. 
in other words, the balance there and, and equality, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity, her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Everybody was in it to make a buck. You know, when um, it, it, a lot of it hasn't changed today. From a religious standpoint, there are people that see Christians as dollar signs and an opportunity to enrich themselves and make money. So what they do, look, P.T. Barnum said it years ago, and it's still true, there's a sucker born every minute. And the problem is, is that scammers know, religious scammers know that um, God's people have an open heart and are willing to give. And they want to exploit that. They take advantage of that. Peter told us that in 2 Peter chapter 2, the first couple of verses. Um, so this is nothing new. Um, it's been like that really since sin entered in to the world so um, the problem here is that the leaders um, were only providing justice if they got paid the priests were only teaching their job was to teach they were the bible teachers they were the spiritual leaders they were only doing it if they got money for it and the prophets who were really the moral leaders that were supposed to redirect israel or their leaders <clears throat> in the right direction um, would only do it if they would receive money for it. They were false prophets that were really um, being singled out here. They were not telling the truth. They were just telling people what they needed to hear, which we'll see uh, for money. Like I say, not much has changed. So under the reasons for judgment, the first one was the corrupt leaders. The second one is the prophets of peace are false. Now, judgment was coming. Babylon was coming down. Uh, we see that not only in the book of Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, but we also, we have it here in Micah because he's contemporary of Isaiah. There's a warning for uh, the judgment to come, which made Jeremiah especially very unpopular. And they actually saw him as treasonous because they said, how can you say that judgment is going to come and that Israel will fail when God is their God? The problem is, is that though God was their God in name, they weren't um, worshiping God in actuality. And so they were only keeping God in name, but they were actually worshiping a lot of um, idols and uh, involved in a lot of uh, paganistic practices. So the false prophets would prophesy peace because that's what people wanted to hear. Uh, again, not much has changed. And <clears throat> because of that, they were deceiving the people. So people like uh, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, they all sounded like they were giving something that was unacceptable, that was contrary because they were speaking about God bringing judgment. And um, it was difficult for them to hear because the the false prophets will always provide something that is appealing for what people want. Now, real prophets will provide comfort even if they're prophesying judgment because when you have the truth, you can live accordingly to it. And there are times uh, that are going to be hard. There are times that are going to be difficult in any nation and in in various times throughout history, we've seen that. So um, pretending that it's it's going to be something different than what it actually is or than what God has told a prophet to prophesy, that doesn't change it. Though people would like to be very positive all the time and hear positive things and, um, you know, things that are positively affirming. Uh, we all like that. But the reality is, is that those things are not always true in the appropriate times when there's a need for repentance, dealing with sin and judgment to come. So the result was this, is that they were perverting the people's faith. Faith is trust. When you trust what is true, then whether the message is difficult or easy to hear, 
your trust is placed in the message because behind the message or the messenger is God. So um, when we trust something that is a lie, then that's a twisting of faith. We're, we're actually believing something that is not real. It's believing a myth. May make a lot of people do that. They feel better in the temporary and they feel better uh, momentarily, but they're actually not living connected to reality. And ultimately they set a pattern for their life that they will end up answering for. So the reasons for judgment, prophets of peace are false. Chapter three brings this out. It resulted in the perverting of faith. What does perverting of faith mean? The explanation, false prophets, dishonest leaders and selfish priests were mixing their selfish motives with an empty display of what it meant to be a Jew under the Mosaic law walking by faith. And then how would we apply that? Well, we don't want to mix our own selfish desires with true faith in God. Once that happens, then it all gets fuzzy and the world's perspectives and culture bleed into the church for us anyways in our time through the cultural norms and the things that are in the culture, which is um, they're dying out there. The last thing that we need to do is duplicate um, what we're supposed to reach so that they can be redeemed. Um, when the church starts becoming like the world and mimicking them because that's what people like, then um, we don't have a message for anybody. And so what we've done is we've mixed our own selfish desires with real faith and then it gets much much more confusing for people because they don't know which end is up so the first example of this um, <clears throat> in chapter 2 verse 11 it says suppose a man who keeps company with a deceiving spirit prophesies like this drink wine and strong drink won't the people accept him as a prophet so again this is the ISV um, I thought it brought it out a little bit better. So the question is asked, if, if some prophet has a deceiving spirit and basically prophesies to the people and says, hey, you should drink wine and strong drink, obviously contrary to the Mosaic law, um, he's saying, won't the people accept him as a prophet? In other words, this is what they're looking for. That's what they wanted to do. So... You have their desire, and then you match their desire to a statement that a religious leader makes that appeals to them because it, it, um, it only confirms what they want to do in their own flesh. And so then they recognize him as a prophet, at least for them, because they're saying what they want to hear. So, <clears throat> you know, again... We have the applicability in our own culture as Christians, you know, um, you know, not to get into the issue of drinking alcohol, but um, I will say this, that too many Christians have glorified it. Uh, you see them on social media, holding up drinks, promoting it as though somehow that makes them free. Um, I think we've lost the definition of freedom if that's the case. So we need to really um, check ourselves to see where we're at. The, if, if we're evaluating ourselves as Christians based on where we're at within the culture, we have no reference point. The reference point we need is the Word of God. And then that way we can determine where we're at and how far off we're at we are from either the truth or how close aligned we are to it. So, um, look, when, um, when I was younger, you know, the advertisement on TV was weekends were made for Michelob. And, um, that was the world's perspective. Uh, when Christians take on that view, that's a problem. That's a serious problem. So <clears throat> in chapter three, verse five, he goes on, he says, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are causing my people to go astray, who are calling out peace 
when they're being fed, but who declare war against those who don't feed them. So um, King James says, you know, bite with their teeth instead of being fed, meaning the same thing. But um, the ISV, I think, again, gives us a little bit more clarity without explanation. And so the false prophets would uh, cause God's people to go astray by telling them things that they wanted to hear, the peace message. Um, and they would do that, and then the people would, would basically pay them. They'd give them money for food um, and, you know, give money to their ministries, right? So then those who did not provide them a message that they liked or they felt like they were, you know, oh, they're, they're not as, um, as positive or... Uh, that's not really what I want to hear. That's uh, that that's a little bit too real for me, too harsh. Or, you know, we don't want to deal with the God of judgment and all this. And, you know, as though that's not a reality, <clears throat> then they would declare war against those who didn't feed them. The false prophets, if they didn't get something from somebody because the people were conditioned to listen to the false prophets. But if the false prophets did not get fed, when they prophesied, then they, then they would come out with the negative prophecies against those people and and talk about how bad they were and how God was against them again because they're not giving to them. Not much has changed. It's really scary in that sense. So the second message um, he gives us in chapter three to five is the doom followed by deliverance. So in chapter three, uh, we have judgment on the nation's leaders, which we just kind of talked about, um, on the rulers, on the prophets, false prophets, and on the leaders. Um, so in chapter four and five, we have the kingdom blessings for the nation that are kind of uh, spelled out for us. We have the characteristics of the kingdom, the first part of uh, chapter four, and then it moves on to things that will precede the kingdom into chapter 5. And then the ruler of that kingdom, as we know, is the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come and rule and reign um, at the end of the tribulation period. So <clears throat> when we look at the characteristics of the millennial kingdom, so this is the kingdom that is set up, uh, that, it's, that is talked about in Revelation 20, Jesus returns. In Revelation chapter 19 and establishes the thousand year reign or millennial reign in chapter 20 of Revelation. So um, we don't get the characteristics of the kingdom there. We get the characteristics of the kingdom because it's related to Israel here in the Old Testament. What we get there is the length of time. It says six times that it's going to be a thousand years. I figure if God has to go uh, through that length to um, tell us that the reign is a thousand years, then it should actually be a thousand years and not, uh, you know, change those those words to a metaf metaphorical or allegorize them as though they're, they're just some other kind of length of time. I think if God needs to tell us specifics about time, he can do that. He does that through the rest of the book of Revelation. He wouldn't certainly change it there. So <clears throat> in verse 1 we see that the kingdom is supreme over all other nations so this is in chapter 4 where again we've just gone through a judgment and then we're told that now we have this kind of reprieve this hope is set up where the coming kingdom uh, will have these characteristics it says but in verse 1 but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord uh, the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow unto it. People meaning the nations are going to come up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. It talks about this in the other prophets also. It's going to be universal. It says many nations shall come. They shall come. Uh, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. 
for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. But you won't need me anymore. He's going to be the Bible teacher. And um, it'll be perfect. So I look forward to that. But that's when the kingdom is going to be universal. It's going to be a kingdom of peace because the Prince of Peace will have set it up. It says, And he shall judge among many people and rebuke, rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So only Jesus can do that. That's not going to ever happen prior to his arrival. Um, it's not the United Nations. They can put that verse outside all they want. They don't have the capacity. There's more wars on the earth since they've been established than any other time. So the, the thing that we know they're not doing is creating peace. It's going to be a secure and prosperous time for the kingdom. And again, you know, you can read through this on your own. Verse 4, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. None shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all people will walk, everyone, in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And then uh, verses 6 and 7, it's going to be a permanent return for Israel. And that day, saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, or that's lame, and I will gather her that's driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted, in other words, lame, uh, a remnant and her that was cast off a strong nation and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever so God's going to gather his people Israel back during this millennial reign and Israel will permanently be in that land so we next see in the next few verses we see the events of the Babylonian captivity how they're going to come down Babylon's mentioned and then the end of the chapter talks about prior to the millennial reign all the nations will come against Jerusalem and the battle uh, of Armageddon will occur so um, that's referred to if you read Zechariah 12 Revelation 16 that has the battle of Armageddon and then chapter 19 of Revelation that has the return of Jesus Christ now <clears throat> the Messiah the King of Peace this is where we get into in chapter 5 you Bethlehem though you are little among the thousands of Judah yet out of you shall come forth to me God is speaking the one to be ruler in Israel who's going forth are from old from everlasting the word everlasting means from the vanishing points talking about from eternity right um, unto us a child is born that's in time right Isaiah told us uh, in chapter 9 verse 6 unto us a son is given right that is the body that he was given coming into the world and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God and they shall abide for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth and this one shall be peace he's the only one that can bring peace so the Messiah the king of peace right here's the explanation God promises a new king now again they had corruption within Judah um, Hezekiah was a great king but you know he he had um, a bad king in front of him he had a bad king behind him so <clears throat> they didn't always have a good king in the southern kingdom out of 20 kings they only have eight good ones so God promises a new king to bring strength and peace to Israel God will restore Israel through the coming Messiah so this will occur in the second coming Revelation 19 the first time he came as a savior the second time he will come as a judge and a king now the application to us we can have God's peace now by giving up our sins and receiving Christ as Savior that doesn't mean you have to change yourself um, really giving ourselves over to Christ for the forgiveness of sins 
trusting in him, receiving him as our Savior. So, let's take a look at this for a minute. So, when we try to narrow down through the Old Testament who the Messiah is, notice first, in the first prophecy of the Bible, we see that he is going to be in the human race, right? This is the first prophecy, Genesis 3.15. He's the seed of the woman. That Next, we find out what ethnic group he's coming from. God created a nation from Abraham. He's going to come through that nation, right? Though Abraham had no offspring as yet, um, God was going to create the nation from him through uh, Isaac and then Jacob and Jacob's 12 kids. So... This is narrowing the Messiah. Out of Jacob's 12 kids, we find that Judah, chapter 49, um, is the tribe that the Messiah would come through as it talks about reigning prophetically for the tribe of Judah. So we're narrowing down, right? Now, within the tribe of Judah, he's going to come from David's dynasty. David gets that promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And so we know now what family within the tribe. How is he going to be coming? Well, he's going to be coming through a virgin birth. And that's Isaiah 7, um, which we're very familiar with that. Th that's quoted by the Gospels. And here's where we come in with our prophecy. Where is he going to be born? So we know how. Now we find out we know who, how, where. Um, and he's going to come out of Bethlehem. And we know that Joseph went down to Bethlehem with Mary because um, they had a census that they took and everybody had to go to their hometown for that census. And then finally, when? And Daniel 9 tells us that um, there's uh, out of 77 year periods, 490 years, um, 69 of those seven-year periods, 483 years on a 360-day calendar, 173,880 days, would start from the command to re restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which was given to um, Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 2 from Artaxerxes Longeminus. And that was according to Sir Robert Anderson in his book, The Coming Prince, where he calculated out the dates. That was given on uh, March 14th, 445 BC. And then if you do the 173,880 days, you get to April 6th, 32 AD, when Jesus rode into town on what we call Palm Sunday, and he was officially rejected in Matthew 22. So um, just amazing prophecy for when. Now notice, Jesus at one point said, had you knew this thy day, but, you know, unfortunately, Israel had rejected him. So we find all this out through the Old Testament, and there's a number of prophecies that surround these and support them. So, um, you know, you would think it would be almost impossible to miss him, but people even miss him today, no matter what we share and no matter what we provide for evidence that Jesus of Nazareth was the coming Messiah. So this predicts his first coming, but we know his second coming is also going to be uh, according to the predictions in the New Testament. So the third message in the last two chapters is the denunciation for sin and a promise of blessing. So there's an indictment by the Lord given in the beginning of chapter 6 the response of Micah for the nation is basically given right after that, which is a normal prophetic response. There's something that's said, and then the prophet kind of responds for the people. Uh, the Lord's judgment because of sin, and then the sins are given to us, the punishment, and then Micah's pleading with the Lord in chapter 7. So he's bemoaning the nation's sins, as many of the prophets do. Um, he shows his confidence in the Lord after that, uh, his prayer that God would again shepherd his flock, which he will, and then the Lord's promise to show miraculous things to his people. And then Micah's affirmation that God 
is unique um, actually really through the end of the book. So <clears throat> as we look at it, God told Israel what to do. This was kind of the focus of what we talked about earlier. The question, and this is uh, dealing with chapter 6, verse 6 to 8. What should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings? This was the question of the people. Um, with seven-year-old calves, would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the child of my body for my own sin? In other words, what does God want? You know, th this is, you know, if he's bringing all this judgment, Micah, then what is God looking for from us? We're, we're, we're doing what we think we should be doing. Now, as we saw previous, they weren't. They were doing some of the external things, but the internal things in their own lives were not there, and the idolatry was deceiving them. So um, that mixed with bad leaders, false prophets, and everything else. No wonder they were confused. But that's the question they ask, and then here's the answer. He has told you, men, what is good and what is the Lord requires of you, what is it the Lord requires of you, only to act justly, to love mercy or faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Hey, God's not looking for, you know, um, these just ridiculously extreme sacrifices or anything like that. He's not looking for them to earn their place with him. He's just looking for them to be obedient to the Mosaic law. That's all he's asking. Uh, and in doing that, they'd be representing him. Um, they would be acting justly, which means they would not be treating people unjustly. They would be faithful or exercising mercy because God is merciful and he wants his people to reflect him. And they would be walking humbly with God as opposed to being arrogant and proud and then just treating people as though they were better uh, than the people that they were ruling over were, where everybody's the same. D different position does not mean that you have a different position with God. Your position in the world or your status may be different than the next person, but that doesn't change your position with God. God has, um, from his perspective, he sees everybody equally, and he just has different people in different roles. So Moses originally said it like this. In Deuteronomy 10, he said, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. It, it didn't change. Moses gave them the law. This is, you know, many years later where Micah was prophesying. He say, Micah's basically saying, what are you talking about, God asking you, you, you know, what kind of sacrifice and you doing this and that? He's not saying that. He's saying, this is, this is what we've known from the law from when Moses gave it. And so Deuteronomy is basically where we have that, that, that whole concept established. And then Micah is really just expanding on that verse. So what is pleasing God? Micah preaches that God's greatest desire was not the offering of sacrifices, but he rather delights in faith that produces justice, love for others, and obedience to him. Remember when uh, the first king, Saul, went out and um, he said that he was obedient to God and everything, and Samuel said no. He said, he said that you haven't been obedient, Saul. You didn't do what the Lord asked. And rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. So um, Samuel was basically telling Saul, you know, look, God is looking for you to be obedient. He, he's, you're rebellious. You're doing things your own way. And so um, that's kind of what Micah is reflecting here. And it, it's unfortunate because um, Saul had an opportunity, really, to, um, to walk with God. And Samuel was a great prophet to direct him. 
But Saul wanted to do things basically his own way. And let me see if I can quickly find that verse. So in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul says, the people took of the spoil. Now, they weren't supposed to. They were, um, they were supposed to destroy the Amalekites. Saul took back not only the king, but he also took back uh, some animals for sacrifice. And Saul says in verse 21, but the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. This is what Samuel is telling Saul, to sacrifice unto the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the voice of the Lord? In other words, if, if we're not obedient, then the things that we offer to God, they don't substitute for that. God wants the obedience. So the, the sacrifices are not in lieu of obedience, sacrifices are designed, depending on, upon which one they are, obviously, um, you know, if it's a sin offering, it's because you sinned, if it's a trespass for trespass and all that. But if you're offering a burnt offering, which is an offering that talks about total consecration, you can't do that in lieu of being disobedient. It's counterproductive. I mean, you're, you're saying here, I want to offer this burnt offering and in, in full consecration to you, Lord, uh, while I'm basically disobeying what you told me to do. So that's why Samuel asks, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken or listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. And then Samuel goes on and he says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So it was pretty simple there. I mean, Sam, Samuel is just telling Saul, you rejected God's word. Well, he's rejecting you from ruling over his people. And effectively, that's what was happening with these people. So pleasing God, it was not unreachable. It's a very reachable thing, and that's what he's trying to share with them here. So, in application, true faith in God generates kindness, compassion, justice, and humility. I mean, as Christians, that's what we should be um, known for. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't stand up for the truth. It doesn't mean that, you know, we don't want to have the culture impose on us, or, or Christians that are ignorant impose on us this idea that if we're not syrupy sweet all the time, then that means there's something wrong with us. Um, I mean, w when you have to stand for the truth, y you have to make a stand, which means that you're disagreeing. And at times, uh, to stand your ground, you know, in your disagreement, you have to give reasons why you're disagreeing. Um, and that involves telling somebody else that, they're incorrect. But in our culture, people don't like to hear that. When you tell somebody that what you're believing is not correct, they get insulted. Now, they don't mind insulting us by saying that what we believe is nonsense, but we're not supposed to do that to them. So look, the, the truth stands on its own. Um, when you share the truth with somebody, you try to do it as loving and as kind as you can. But the reality is, is that um, the truth is going to offend people. Jesus said it would, um, you know, and we see that not only uh, in the Gospels, but in the, the rest of the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the truth offends people. The Gospel offends people. The Gospel tells people that they're sinners and that they need a Savior. But people don't want to hear that. What they want to hear is that I'm fine and you're fine and everything's fine and the world is fine and everybody should just be giving each other a big hug. Well, the reality is, is that the world is not fine. And to try to pretend that it is, you're living in a fantasy. You know, it's the twilight zone. So um, that's why we should be exercising kindness, compassion, justice, and humility as we communicate with people or interact with them 
But true faith in God is based in truth. So even in your kindness, compassion, your justice, your humility, that has to be in truth. Otherwise, it's a lie. And we're not being true to God's word. Like Saul, we're rejecting the word of the Lord. So we need to stay aligned with the truth. How do we know we have genuine repentance? So this is an important question to sum up with because within the context of Micah, it would be difficult for the Jews um, because they were so far off and so confused as to what the truth was. How did they know that they actually had genuine repentance? Well, there's a quote by G. Campbell Morgan, I think, that helps us here, right? So in his commentary on Micah, he said, herein is discovered the difference between remorse and, re and penitence, which is really um, 100 years ago, it's kind of what they called repentance when they talked about it, um, to, to simplify it. So in remorse, a man is sorry for himself. He mourns over his sin because it has brought suffering to him. So basically, I did something wrong. There's consequences, and I feel bad for myself. Um, I, I'm sad for me. You know, I, you know, um, I get caught with my hand in the cookie jar, and you know, now I feel bad because, um, you know, people look at me like I did something wrong, um, or I'm suffering. You know, the punishment, if I get, if I'm a kid and I get sent to my room, if I feel bad for me, I had to spend all day in my room. What would you do? I did something that I shouldn't have done. Well, then you should have been put to your room. Well, you know, and then you just kind of pout and feel bad for you. That's what, that's what remorse is, right? In penitence, or we'll call it repentance, uh, Morgan says he's grieved by the wrong sin has done to God. And he yields his personal suffering uh, in the confidence that it is God is uh, that by it, God is setting him free from his sin. So in genuine repentance um, or the suffering that is caught penitence, really the, 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 the suffering that is caused by what I do, the, the, the hurt that comes to me, um, then. I look at that as, you know, Lord, I'm sorry that I've done this. I've not only wronged you, but this pain that I've brought to my own life, um, it is a means of your setting me free. You are teaching me this is not the right way to live. You're teaching me that this is the thing that I need to change in order to not only be right with you, but right with everybody else and right with myself. You know, um, you know, Paul talks about it in the letter to Titus. He says the grace of God has appeared to all men teaching us. Well, uh, the gospel is come through the grace of God and that gospel teaches us. What's it teach us? It teaches us that we're sinners. We need a savior. Well, that's hard for some people to handle. They don't want to feel as though they're a savior. That's fine. But that's the instruction that we need. You know, so anyways, that's the book of Micah and um, may God continue to bless you as you continue to dig into his words and get those pearls out of it. Amen.